yesterday. Yeah, I was. I think so. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, we were talking about um, um, still cheese functions and things like that, and the fact that in physics, um, we're very lucky that we're trying to solve physics problems because, um, you know, there aren't any of the crazy things that might happen. Uh, physics actually works extremely well, and that's because you're solving a Schrodinger equation, and the eigenvalues for a Schrodinger equation have very nice properties. Okay, so what we argued was that if you have um, some sort of differential equation like this. <clears throat> okay, you have some sort of Schrodinger equation like this. We argued that to solve this problem, the first step is putting in an epsilon. That's what we did on the very first day of the course. Okay, insert an epsilon. Now you're not solving one problem, but you're solving an infinite number of problems. Um, and your, for each problem, there's a different eigenvalue. They all depend on epsilon. Um, we assume a series in powers of epsilon. Okay. And to our shock, we find out that the series is a divergent series. So the equal sign is not right. So we have to replace this by an asymptotic sign. Okay, as epsilon goes to zero. Um, and now that we have a divergent series that represents the answer we're looking for, what do we do? And what we are, we are very, very lucky to find out that in fact, E of epsilon, you can prove not from this, but directly from the problem that we're trying to solve from the Schrodinger equation that E of epsilon has all the properties that you want, namely properties 1, 2, 3, and 4, um, so that so, so has uh, properties 1, 2, 3, and 4. And this tells us, this implies that E of epsilon <coughs> is a function of still sheets. And now we're in great shape. Because now that we know that it's a function of still sheets, this tells us that the Pades uh, converge. So what you can do is you can take this series and convert this series, n equals 0 to infinity a sub n epsilon to the n, you, convert, you can convert this series to a sequence of pades. And there are two sequences you can have. You can have the sequence p n n of epsilon, and you can have the sequence p n n plus 1 of epsilon. Okay? And now that you know. <coughs> Now that you know that it is a function of Stilchy's, each of these separate sequences converges. Okay? This guy converges downward. This guy converges upward. So as a function of n, if you draw the sequences, this guy, this sequence here looks like this. The lower sequence looks like this. And what we know is that the correct answer, and, and of course, this se all the terms in this sequence lie above all of the elements of that sequence. Okay, so you have two monotone sequences bounding each other, and a bounded monotone sequence converges to a limit. Okay, so that's one of the early theorems that you prove in first-year calculus. So we know that this sequence approaches a limit, that sequence approaches a limit, and it would be really great if they approach the same limit. Okay? In fact, we know that, so in fact, we know that the answer that we are looking for, E of epsilon, is 
is greater is greater than all of the elements in that sequence, p n n plus one, okay, and it's less than all of the elements in that sequence for all n. Okay. Yeah. What happens if we do shanks on this right now? Do we get closer to the answer? If we do a shanks on this, yeah. um, if that's a very interesting question. If the if this sequence um, if, if this is converging to the same limit, then it will converge very very much much more rapidly to that limit so that you can extract many more decimal places. Okay, so what we have been doing is only taking the raw limit. We haven't tried to um, accelerate the limit. However, if they do not approach the same limit, that's a very interesting question, because the shanks may not converge to a limit. It may converge to two limits. Okay, there's no reason why the shanks has to converge to one limit and it can converge to two limits. Okay. Furthermore, if it converges to one limit, there's no, I don't know, what, I mean, in, ver in, in, there may be two, possibil two possible outcomes. Okay. If it converges to one limit, there's no guarantee that that limit has anything to do with the correct answer. Okay. So there's some danger in doing that. Okay. But that, that's a very interesting question. And it would be very interesting to see what happens. I don't know, I don't know if I ever tried in the case of an x to the 8 potential. We're going to talk about that in a second. But in, the, in that case, don't know whether or not the shanks converges to two limits or to one limit. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what happens. And it may just be converged to something noisy. You see, because when you go very, very far out, this is essentially horizontal. And this is essentially horizontal. So when you calculate the shanks, you get nonsense. I mean, this number and this number are effectively the same number. But the middle number is different. So you compute the shanks from three subsequent things, right? So you either take two of these and one of these, or you take two of these and one of these. So you're going, you know, bloom, 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 like that. Three, three successive things. If you do that, almost certainly you're going to get two limits, okay? simply because these two numbers are, for all intents and purposes, the same. So kind of, it, that's an interesting question. But it would be worth trying to see what happens. And you can generate those numbers quite easily for an x to the 8 theory. It would be a nice project to see what happens. The reason is that you can get as many terms in uh, as many coefficients as you like just by solving a simple recursion equation. Okay, you don't have to use Feynman diagrams or something hard to calculate these numbers. You can do it using a recursion relation. If you're interested, I'll show you after the class. Um, and it's published. In fact, you can, you can read it. There, there are lots of papers. Um, Okay, so, <clears throat> so the problem is whether or not this limit and that limit happen to be the same limits. Now, we do know, because it's a function of Stilchies, that this is true. But we still, so at least we know roughly what the answer is going to be. You understand, if you do this problem numerically, if you actually sit down in front of a computer and do all this junk, these two numbers will be very close together. I mean, this number might be you know, 3.25, and this might be 3.35. So there might be only a very small distance between those two numbers. So if you're happy with one or two decimal places, one and a half decimal places accuracy, you can say, the answer is in there, and I'm happy. You can walk away. But that's usually not very satisfying. So we would like to know more. And this is what I started to talk about last time. Um, this. So this has to do with the Carloman condition. And the Carloman condition says that if 
um, a sub n grow no faster um, than uh, if, if this bunch of numbers, a sub n, grow no faster than uh, 2n factorial, then L1 is equal to L2, and everything is great. OK? And interestingly, if V in that, so if V of x is just, say, x squared, and W of x is x to the fourth, then a sub n grows like n factorial times a constant to the n. So it's the n factorial that's important. And the question is, why does it grow like n factorial? And in fact, so you've studied quantum field theory. You've had a little bit of experience with phi to the 4 quantum field theories, right? You've done a little bit. Have you done any normalization? Yes. Yeah. A few graphs, things like that. Good. OK. So this is, in fact, behaving just like a phi to the 4 quantum field theory. So in fact, let's try to understand why this is growing like n factorial. So I'm going to give you a heuristic argument. Okay, This is going to make lots of jumps. But the argument can be made quite precise. Okay? So Roughly speaking, why is there an n factorial? Well, that's easy to explain. If you have a g phi to the 4 theory, and you're trying to make some sort of perturbation calculation, so you're calculating a Green's function of some sort, it doesn't really matter what kind of Green's function you're calculating. You start drawing Feynman diagrams. And a Feynman diagram is nothing but a bunch of dots called vertices. And coming out of each dot, there are four lines. Why are there four lines? Because it's a phi to the 4 field theory. Okay. So what are you instructed to do? You're instructed to connect up the lines Okay, and add up all the graphs having n vertices. Okay. So if you sum up all graphs, With n vertices, the sum of all those graphs, now when I say the sum of the graphs, a graph is just a bunch of dots and lines. But Mr. Feynman, very interesting character, by the way. Any of you read some of his books? Yeah? My uncle was Feynman's high school teacher. <laughs> he talks about his, his high school teacher, how much he loved his high school teacher, and how his high school teacher got him interested in physics and gave him a book on variational calculations and things like that. That was my own. Um, very nice character, by the way. I spent a summer with him um, when I, I, I worked at Caltech for a summer just for fun and did some research. Feynman was there, so we used to have lunch every day, a bunch of us. Quite an interesting guy to, to work with. Fastest thinker I've ever met. Um, no one else I've ever met has come even faintly close. We'd sit at lunch, and he would say, um, in his Brooklyn accent, I also have a Brooklyn accent, but, but I concealed mine. And he worked on his. He practiced in front of the mirror. Um, and um, he would say, so how's it going? And uh, we'd say, there were three of us who were working on We'd say, well, we showed this and this and this and this. And we'd say, mm, very good. Bullshit. <laughs> he always said that. And the first time he said it, I was stunned. And he said, you see, you showed this and this, but that implies that. This implies this and that follows from that. And therefore, you're wrong. Contradiction. And we could never answer them. And we'd go off and we'd calculate all afternoon and all next morning. And much more often than not, he was wrong. 
<laughs> but we couldn't, on the spot, show why he was wrong. You had to really go deeply into the problem. But when we finally understood it, we went back the next day. We'd sit down at lunch, and he'd say, so how's it going? <laughs> we'd say, well, you said yesterday that, da, da, da. but in fact, there's a contradiction in your argument because you assumed that this was true, but that's not. He would say, ah, oh, very good. He never took it personally. <laughs> Perfectly happy to just think about science without getting personally involved. And then he would say, very, very good. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'd come up with something else. And this would go on and on and on. It was very interesting. Very interesting. By the end of the summer, we had a good project. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so Mr. Feynman explains to us how to turn this bunch of dots and lines into a number by evaluating some intervals. Okay? You add up these numbers, so when you sum up all the graphs, I mean you sum up all the numbers associated with those graphs, having n vertices, and that is equal to the nth term in the perturbation expansion. So the question is, how big is that? Okay. So let's imagine, <clears throat> let's imagine that you have n vertices. Okay. And each vertex has four lines coming out of it, like this. Okay. Now, if you were to try to construct all the graphs, of course, there might be some external lines. You might have some external lines coming out. But there's only a finite number of them. So who cares? We don't care. So for example, if you're calculating the four-point function, there would be four of these lines connected to the outside world, but that's only four. Who cares? Okay. So the rest of the lines, the rest of these dots, are connected to themselves. So how many graphs are there? Well, <clears throat> let's pick any line at random, say that one. How many possible places can we connect this line to? 4n minus 1. 4n minus 1, OK. So there are 4n minus 1, 4n minus 1 loose ends sticking out. So we just connect it to one of those lines. OK. So there are 4n minus 1 ways of doing that. There are, of course, three more lines coming out of here, and so on. OK, now we pick another line at random. Who cares which one? Say this one. Okay. How many possible ways are there to connect this line to these graphs? 4n minus 3. 4n minus 3. And we continue this process okay, until everything is all connected up. So we continue like that. So that gives us 4n minus 1 double factorial. You all know the symbol double factorial. Okay, it means you're multiplying all, you're multiplying every other number together, just the odd numbers: four n minus one, four n minus three, four n minus five, and so on. Okay. However, we are overcounting. Why are we overcounting? Okay. Well, to begin with, there are we these vertices. We've assumed that. They're all identical. Okay, we've treated them identically, but we have to we have to work we have to divide out all the possible rearrangements of those vertices. Okay, we label these vertices one, two, three, four, five. There are n factorial labelings for those vertices, so we have far too many graphs. So we have to divide by n factorial. Okay, we still are overcounting. Okay, because when I said we take this line and connect it to this, <coughs> okay, we can just as easily have connected it to this, you see, or to this, or to this, okay. 
So when I connect it to a vertex, so these lines coming out of the vertex are identical. And when I pick those lines or connect to those lines, there are clearly there's a rearrangement. I could, could have gone to this line first, or that line first, or that line first, or that line first. So I'm going to number these, you know, one, two, three, four, in that order. That means there are four factorial arrangements of those lines. So I have to divide by 24. Okay, four factorial. Ah, but wait a minute, there are n vertices. So I have to divide by 24 to the n. Okay? That's how many graphs there are. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait a minute. It could be that the graphs that you drew, that when, you, when you drew these graphs, it could be that this was connected to this, this was connected to this, this was connected to this. It might have come out that this was a disconnected part. And the kinds of graphs that we are interested in in quantum field theory are connected graphs. Okay? <coughs> However, in the counting of graphs, the chance of this happening is so slim that we don't care. It turns out it doesn't make any difference in the overall count in the number of graphs, asymptotically. Okay? All it does is it changes the overall constant out front. Okay? It may, it, it, there may be a factor of one half or one tenth or something like that. But in terms of the growth of the number of graphs, we don't care. We just don't care. <clears throat> Great. So how big is this when n is large? Well, let me turn this into a factorial. A uh, question. Yeah. What are you basing this fact on that you have not, not that many disconnected gaps? Oh, yeah. I've done the calculation with great precision. Okay, and I can cite a paper for you. There's, so I'm, I'm going quickly. Well, so I'm not going to give you the argument, but I, I can, after class, if you like, I can go into detail about it. But it turns out that the, the number of connected graphs compared with the number of graphs, um, that the difference is irrelevant. Okay? In fact, the, <clears throat> asymptotically, the number of disconnected, the number of all graphs compared with the number of disconnected graphs, if you take that ratio and let n go to infinity, it approaches 1. Okay? And I'll show you why that is. It, it has to do with the fact that, um, that, uh, um, that you can write down the generating function for the number of graphs. And you can write down the generating function for the number of connected graphs. Okay? So if a sub n is the number of all is the exact number of all graphs having n vertices, and C n is the number of connected graphs. So C n, of course, is smaller than A n. The number of connected graphs is smaller than the number of all graphs. Okay? Right? And if you write down the generating function, a sub n x to the n, call that f of x, okay? And c sub n x to the n, call that g of x. So this is the generating function. Then the, the relation between f and g is very interesting, okay? It turns out that the sum of all graphs, okay, um, is one is is the exponential, right now, 1 plus the sum of all graphs, is the exponential of the number of connected graphs. Okay? This is an, a precise statement relating the number of all graphs here to the number of connected graphs here. Very interesting. And from this, you can derive a difference equation satisfied by a sub n and c sub n. Okay? And it's something like um, a n minus c n is the sum from j equals 1 to n minus 1 of a n c or a j c n minus j, something like that. And from this, you can solve this equation asymptotically. This is um, 
a convolution here. It solved this equation asymptotically and show that a sub n is asymptotic to c sub n as n goes to infinity. So, okay, so I can I can go over details with you. <clears throat> okay, question is how big is this? Okay, and let's make this into a factorial. You know, and, and the way we can do that is we can just turn this into 4n factorial if we multiply by all the numbers that are missing. Remember, all the even numbers are missing here. How many numbers are missing? Well, we would have to put in the denominator, we would have to put in um, 2n factorial times 2 to the 2n. Okay. So there are 2n numbers that are missing from here. So what are the two numbers? They're all the even numbers between 2 and 4n. Okay, And those numbers are 2n factorial times 2 to the 2n. All right, good. So how big is this? Well, we can calculate how big that is. 4n factorial is roughly 4n to the 4n times e to the minus 4n. That's the Stirling formula, right? And n factorial is roughly n to the n e to the minus n. 24 to the n, well, that's just 24 to the n. And uh, 2 to the 2n. Well, that's just 4 to the n. Okay. And 2n factorial is 2n, 2n to the 2n times e to the minus 2n. Did you see all that? Is that clear? So each of those factorials can be approximated by this and this, and this. <clears throat> okay. So this is an approximation to these factorials. But now we can simplify this. Let's see what we've got. We've got an n to the n here, n to the n, and n to the 4n, n to the 4n here. And here we have and n to the 2n. Okay. Then we have numbers. So here is a 4 to the 4n, and we have an, uh, that number. We have a 24, 24 to the n from here. We have a 4 to the n from here. We have a 2 to the 2n, which is another 4 to the n. 4 to the n from here. Okay, so those are various numbers to the power n. And then we have exponentials, right? We have on top e to the minus 4n. And on the bottom, we have e to the minus n and e to the minus 2n. Here's the e to the minus 2n, e to the minus n, e to the minus 4 So I think that's everything. So now let's simplify this. So all together, we have n to the n, n to the 2n, n to the 4n. So we have overall n to the n. But what about, what about the e's, the powers of e? e to the minus 4n, e to the minus 1n and 2n, that gives me e to the minus n. Okay, So that takes care of these numbers. Then here we have 4 to the 4n. Right? So that gives me altogether uh, 4 to the n, 4 to the n, 4 to the n, and 4 to the n. Four of them <coughs> all together. This cancels two of them. Got it? So we now have 16 to the n over 24 to the n. Okay? So 16 to the n over 24 to the n. We don't really care about this. This is just some constant to the n. 
And this is approximately n factorial. So the number of graphs is roughly n factorial times some constant to the n. This constant is 16 24 ths, but who cares? It doesn't make any sense. <coughs> so the number of graphs is growing like n factorial. That's a good thing. Because with that estimate, we now know that we have satisfied the Carloman condition, and that's why you can do this calculation. It just works from start to end. We know that the Pades are going to converge. And they're not only going to converge, they're going to converge to the right answer. Isn't that a fantastic? This is a real tour de force. Okay? We start out with an infinitely hard problem. We break it down to an infinite sequence of solvable problems. We get a divergent series, and we sum the series. And with the theorems of Stilchies behind us, we know that when we sum that series using pad A, we're going to get the right answer. This is really fantastic. Okay? Yeah. Is there a connection with the normalization? No. In fact, um, <clears throat> here I never said anything about renormalization. But the counting of graphs doesn't <coughs> change when you renormalize. Because you're just subtracting graphs from one another. So that doesn't make any difference. When you renormalize, what happens is that, you know, <clears throat> in higher dimension, not here, because in the work that we've done in quantum mechanics, you don't get any infinities. But in higher dimension, um, some of these graphical integrals, not all of them, but some of them diverge. So you need to do subtractions. Okay? But it doesn't change the fact that you have a growth like n factorial times a constant to the end. It still gives you, after renormalization, the series still diverges. It still has a zero radius of convergence. Okay? And it's Borel sum or Pade sum of them. Um, so if you repeat this argument, however, for a phi to the sixth theory, you can sort of see what's going to happen. If instead of a phi to the fourth theory, if we did a phi to the sixth theory, then there would be two more lines coming out of all of these vertices. <coughs> OK? And if there are two more lines, then instead of 4n minus 1 factorial, what would you have? 6n minus 1. So now, when you, went through, when, you did this, when you do this calculation, instead of ending up with n factorial here, you'd end up with 2n factorial. And if you had a phi to the 8th, instead of 6n minus 1 factorial, you'd have 8n minus 1 factorial. And so this would be 3n factorial. Uh-uh, now you violated the Carlman. We have a problem. Okay? It's very interesting. Very interesting uh, problem. Um, of course, I just gave you a heuristic argument. Part of what you have to show is that, you know, I didn't say what happens when you do these integrals. You might think, wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe some of the Feynman integrals give you a small number, like 1 over n factorial or something like that. Is that possible? And the answer is yes, but only an insignificant number of Feynman integrals can give you something very, very small that might compensate for n factorial. The average Feynman integral goes like a constant to the n. In fact, what you can do, and this is really Wonderful. This is really fun. You can study the statistical behavior of Feynman diagrams. Okay? That is to say, you can imagine, instead of, you know, when you do statistics, you, you start out by thinking of you know, the, the simple model is you have a box with gas molecules in the box. And you can study the thermodynamic properties of gas molecules, many of them, in a box and talk about entropy, and talk about a distribution, and talk about temperature, and so on. OK? Well, here you have a bunch of vertices. You can have a huge number of vertices. You can let n go to infinity. And now, what does the Feynman diagram look like? It looks like a pot of spaghetti, okay? an incredibly complicated mass of lines, infinite numbers of vertices and infinite numbers of lines. 
and you can study the distribution of graphs. Okay? And you can study, you can actually come up with the concept of an average graph, just the way temperature is an average measure of gas molecules in a box, okay, and pressure is an average measure of molecules in a box bouncing around inside of the box. Okay, so there are various thermodynamic quantities. The same is true with Feynman diagrams. Okay? So as n goes to infinity, the Feynman diagram becomes a continuous, it's not a bunch of individual dots connected by lines like this, okay? but it's a continuous bunch of dots connected by a continuum of lines. And you can study those thermodynamic properties. You can go to the limit of continuous Feynman diagrams, not discrete graphs connected, lines connected by dots, but sort of a sheet of, of dots and lines. Okay? And if you're interested, I can recommend papers and things for you to read. Very interesting. Very interesting stuff. Um, I think I should say one more thing before we move on. And that is, um, you know, these are rough estimates that we made. We estimated that the reason that perturbation theory diverges is that there are a lot of graphs. Okay? That's all. That's why perturbation theory must be diverging. Okay? But can you come up with a much more precise statement of how rapidly perturbation theory diverges. And I want to give you an indication about how you can study, you know, this is, this is imprecise, but suppose we wanted to know precisely A sub n goes like, is asymptotic to what as n goes to infinity. Can you give me a precise answer to that question? How would you go about doing it? And there are a number of ways of going about doing it. You can do the statistical mechanics of Feynman diagrams with great precision. And there are lots and lots of research projects there for you to do. Okay. So I've written a number of papers on the subject, but there's, this is basically an untrodden area, very interesting area. But let me give you one very interesting way of, of answering the question. Um, Because this, goes, this is a fairly elementary way of approaching the problem. So how would you go about doing it? We're imagining that you have, just to make things simple, we're imagining just that Schrodinger equation up there. And we are calculating this function, e of epsilon is asymptotic to the sum of a sub n epsilon to the n. Okay? Now, for the problem that you were looking at, just think about it a second, to be a little bit more precise, if we had the Schrodinger equation where we had an x squared over 4 plus epsilon x to the 4 over 4, you did, isn't that right, Tabor, you, you spent some time in, in the tutorials, and you found that the perturbation series begins, for the ground state energy, begins 1 half plus 3 quarters epsilon um, minus 21 eighths epsilon squared plus 333 over 16 epsilon cubed. You, you saw that. And you should be a little bit upset by this, because this is obviously not a Stilchi series. Why is that? Here, all along, I've been saying that you can use pod A, but there's a little bit of imprecision. Yeah? The first term is the wrong sign. That's right. It's not alternating in sign. The Stilchi series, the first thing, the first property, the most obvious glaring property of the Stilchi series is that it alterna it's an alternating series. So you're completely correct. But it turns out that to correct that problem is very easy. You simply subtract 1 half and divide by epsilon. Okay? So it's not really e that I'm interested in, but rather e minus 1 half uh, divided by epsilon. 
okay? Because this is asymptotic to 3 quarters minus 21 eighths epsilon plus 333 <coughs> 16 epsilon squared, and so on. And it's this that <coughs> is a Stilchy series, okay? So to be precise, this is the thing that is a function of Stilchy's. And this is the thing that is her glots and so on. Okay? <clears throat> All right. And this is the thing that is analytic in the cut plane. And that's the key point. Analytic in the cut plane. Aha. Here is the cut here's here is a cut plane. Here is the point epsilon right there, say. There's epsilon. We'll call this the T plane. What is the Cauchy theorem saying? This is starting out just like what I was saying last time. What does Cauchy's theorem say? It says that E of epsilon can be written as the integral um, around some contour like this of dt <coughs> over t minus epsilon e of t. Okay? And just as we did last time, we can push this contour around like that. Okay? Let, let this go off to infinity. And so you can, can, you can show that e of t uh, can, be, can be written as an integral from minus infinity to 0, and there's a 1 over 2 pi i here, 1 over 2 pi i, times um, uh, dt over uh, t minus epsilon. And instead of t, what we have is the discontinuity across the cut. Okay, and the discontinuity across the cut is 2 times the imaginary part of the energy. The discontinuity, okay, two times the imaginary part of the energy times i, okay, and let's cancel a factor of two i. Now I'm going to do something very strange. I'm going to say, wait a minute. In this integral, I have one over uh, t minus epsilon, okay. Just for laughs, okay, just for laughs, I'll write that as 1 over t times 1 over 1 minus epsilon over t. And I will write that as the sum from epsilon, uh, from uh, 0 to infinity, epsilon to the n over t to the n. Okay? And I'll stick this right in here, and I'll integrate term by term. Now, if I do that, that means I'm illegally interchanging the orders of integration and summation. But I'm going to do it anyway. Of course, I know that because I'm doing it illegally, I'm going to wind up with a divergent series. Which divergent series? You know perfectly well which divergent series. It is the divergent series for E, which is a sub n epsilon to the n. Okay? Of course, I have to be careful. This is not really an equal sign, but it's an asymptotic sign. But asymptotic series are unique, and therefore, I can identify the nth term here with the nth term here. Got it? So I conclude that the nth term, a sub n, can be written as an integral from minus infinity to 0, dt over t to the n plus 1, t to the n plus 1, okay, n of these and n more and one more, um, times the imaginary part of e. This is inequality. What I showed you was that the nth term in the perturbation series is the nth 
inverse moment, not a moment. This is a strange kind of moment. It's the inverse moment of the imaginary part of E for negative T. Woo. OK, so now let's be very careful. Uh, shouldn't you have one over pi? Yeah, and there's a one over pi. That's right. But this is an exact statement. Okay. Now, this is incredible. OK, because we have a formula for the nth term in the perturbation series. Now, let's think about what this formula means. This is a really interesting formula. We wanted the nth term in the perturbation series for the potential. So we started out with the potential x squared over 4 plus epsilon x to the fourth over 4. And we wanted a sub n. That is the coefficient in the perturbation series, you know, a sub n epsilon to the n. And we've come up with the conclusion that a sub n is the nth inverse moment of the imaginary part of the energy. So there's a t to the n, dt n plus 1, n, n plus first in, inverse moment. Okay? <clears throat> but we are calculating E for this value of T. T is real, but negative. Right? You see this? It goes from minus infinity to zero. That means, so this is what we're instructed to do. Take the imaginary part of the energy when t is negative and integrated. So we're not calculating in this potential, because we always were assuming that epsilon is positive. In fact, what this calculation instructs us to do is to consider the potential x squared over 4 minus t times x to the 4 over 4, or it's plus t, but t is negative. t is a negative number here. You see that? You all see that? This integral goes from minus infinity to 0. So I'm to calculate the imaginary part of e. What is the imaginary part of the energy? And what does this potential look like when t is negative? This potential looks like this for epsilon positive. But this potential looks like this because t is negative. So if we're calculating, say, the ground, there, there are a bunch of energy levels here. If we're calculating the ground state energy, we have to go down here and stick this ground state energy in this well. What happens if you put a particle in this well? It escapes. Why is that? <coughs> Say again? It's tunneling, right? This is tunneling. So it tunnels through the barrier and escapes off to infinity. So the state now decays in time. It's radioactive. It has a half-life. What is the imaginary part of the energy? It's the decay rate. Right? It has to do with the lifetime of the state. Do you see that? So I've shown you that the nth term in perturbation theory corresponds to taking the nth inverse moment of the lifetime of a state in an upside down potential. Woo! And this came out of an analytic continuation theory. That's what we did by pushing this contour. In fact, what we derived is called the dispersion relation. How many of you have heard of the dispersion relation? Okay, a, di a dispersion relation comes from doing an analytic continuation. And the dispersion relation relates two quantities that are not at all obviously connected. We are relating the large order behavior of perturbation theory in this potential to the lifetime of a state in this potential. 
wow, <laughs> they're not at all obviously connected. But this is not just an approximate statement. This is an equality. This is an exact statement. And now I can use WKB theory. Oops, that's something I'm going to be teaching you starting now to calculate the lifetime of a state in this well. And if I take that lifetime from WKB and substitute it into this integral, I can then give you the asymptotic behavior of A sub n for large n. Okay? And that gives you a precise statement. And what you learn from this calculation is that A sub n is, is a precise asymptotic behavior is minus 1 to the n plus 1 times n factorial, okay, and more precisely, gamma of n plus 1 half times 3 to the n <coughs> times the square root of 6 over pi to the 3 halves. And that's the precise asymptotic behavior as n goes to infinity. Okay. So we had, over here, we gave a rough argument. We said it went roughly like n factorial times a constant to the n. But this is the precise asymptotic behavior. Yeah, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to talk any more about that because this gets very, very. So I missed a connection there. You said that it's not e, but e minus half by epsilon, which is analytic on the cut plane. Yes, but then you to be precise, instead of instead of <coughs> substituting e in here, oh, so you would use that whole, whole you really need to substitute that to right. do a more careful calculation. You really have to do that. Okay, and I, I'm not going to go into the details of that. There's, the reason is that this is not, there's a problem with this function at infinity. And when I let the, when I, with this function at infinity, when I go off to infinity, I actually do get a contribution from this outside loop. But this gives me an extra factor of 1 over epsilon. And now I no longer have that. So it's really, to, to, do, this, to do this very, very precisely, instead of using e, I really have but I'm not going to go into the details of that. OK? OK, I think you now have a picture. But now, to complete this course, I want to talk to you about WKB, because this is an, a fantastically beautiful um, uh, way of solving <coughs> problems. I think I have yeah, enough time to give you an introduction. So. OK, good. So, so unless there are any questions, that sort of completes what I wanted to say about an introduction to perturbation theory. <coughs> and WKB is an example of a very, very powerful kind of perturbation theory. It is called, let me give you the history of it just quickly. What does WK and B stand for? Say, what does it stand for? That's right. W is Wenzel. Okay. Um, do, do you know what the question is whose answer is 9W? Can you think of a question whose answer is 9W? The question would be, tell me, Mr. Wenzel, do you spell your name with a V? <laughs> you would say 9 W. All right, never mind. Um, so, um, so W is Wenzel, K is Cromer's, B is Brian, and this method that I'm going to tell you about is named after these guys, and it's completely unfair. And, and people who work on this know that this is not an appropriate name for what I'm going to teach you, but it's stuck. So it's tradition. It's, there it is. It's not appropriate because there's one guy named Jeffries, Lord Jeffries, who understood WKB far better and understood it before these guys understood it. And so if you read some books on WKB, they call it WKB uh, J theory. Okay. However, Lord Jeffries, even though he understood it, a lot better than W. Actually, Lord Je I never met Lord Jeffries. That was before my time. But I met his wife, um, who was also a brilliant mathematician, Lord <coughs> Jeffries. 
But she, I met her, she was about 92, um, something like that, when I met her, and very sharp. And we were sitting in a seminar together, and she was sitting in the front row listening to every word. And in the middle of the seminar, she stopped the speaker and she said, young man, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> she was completely right. Um, so the, you should call it WKBJ theory, except that this is not historically appropriate, because Lord Rayleigh understood it far better than any of these guys. And it should really be called our theory. However, Lord Rayleigh was preceded by Mr. Green. So maybe it should be called G theory. And nobody can come to a, a satisfactory conclusion about what you call this. So I'm just going to call it, I'm going to follow the inappropriate name, which is WKB. So that's the historical background. Um, WKB theory is a tech, is goes under the, what field theorists call it is semi-classical methods, okay? But WKB is an easier word. It's easier to say WKB than it is to say semi-classical, okay? For me, anyway. And uh, how do you, where does WKB come about? Well, we're solving the Schrodinger equation, which is, you know, minus y prime prime uh, plus v of x y is equal to e y. OK. And typically, what we do is we say, fine, we'll put y double prime on the other side of the equation. This is equal to v of x uh, minus e times y. So in general, we're solving an equation of this form. Okay. However, as you know, this is the dimensionless Schrodinger equation. And there is something that goes in here, which is h bar squared, some nonsense like that. And people like to think, at least some people say, well, h bar is a small number. Okay, And so there's a small parameter in here. Okay, that's nonsense, of course, because h bar has dimensions. You can't think of a dimensional number as being small. So that's not appropriate. Okay. But what we're going to do is we're going to say, if h bar goes to 0, then the theory in some sense becomes classical. So the difference between <laughs> classical physics and quantum physics is something like taking the limit as h bar goes to 0. So if we're going to do a semi-classical, that means slightly quantum calculation, we should imagine putting a very small number here. And it's traditional to insert a very small number squared for reasons that you're going to see. Okay, so we could put an epsilon over here, but it's an epsilon squared. Now, right away, you can see that this is a very strange kind of perturbation theory. Why is that? Why is this a very strange way of putting an epsilon to the problem? Because epsilon equals zero, you don't have Right, right. That's exactly right. So if epsilon is non-zero, this is a differential equation, second-order differential equation. And the solution contains two arbitrary constants so that we could satisfy two initial conditions or two boundary conditions, right? And if you set epsilon to zero, this becomes an algebraic equation. In fact, a trivial algebraic equation. And we're going to do it anyway. Okay? And that's why WKB is so interesting. Okay? So the question is, what does the perturbation series look like? It can't possibly look like a Taylor series. It can't possibly look like a Taylor series. This could not possibly be right. It couldn't be that y looks like um, y sub n epsilon to the n. This is not possible. Why is that? Why is that not possible? The reason is that what about dominant balance? In the limit as epsilon goes to 0, 
if y looks has this structure, then the left side of this equation would be proportional to epsilon squared, and the right side would be proportional to 1. That's not a dominant balance. Can't possibly work. So it must be that y double prime is very big. It must be that y double prime is of order 1 over epsilon squared. Otherwise, how could you have a dominant balance between the left side of the equation and the right side of the equation? Okay. So let me show you the form of the perturbation series. It's very interesting. This is not the form of the perturbation series, but rather the perturbation series has the form E to the S, where S so we're going to make the substitution y is e to the s, where s has the form 1 over epsilon times s0 plus s1 plus epsilon s2 plus epsilon squared s3, and so on. That is, it has the form 1 over epsilon times the sum of s and epsilon to the f. Okay. And the key thing here is that there's a 1 over epsilon out front. That's the idea. Okay. Now, um, so what we're going to assume is that y is represented by a perturbation series of the form sum of 1 over epsilon n equals 0 to infinity s sub n epsilon to the n. That's the assumption that you make when you do WKB. Okay, and this is called the WKB series. Yeah? Uh, why do, can we put uh, the equality in the four exponent? Why can we? We're going to assume that the perturbation series has this form. We have to show that this is valid. Okay, I'm beginning, so I begin my analysis by assuming that this is the structure of the answer. Okay, I'm going to try this series. I'm going to try finding a, a series of this form. And I'm going to show you that it's valid. That is, I'm going to show you that S2, I'm going to sh show you that S2 is negligible compared with 1. We, have, we don't see that yet, but we have to show that. Okay? Now, that is the S2 term, that is S2 epsilon, is negligible compared with 1 as epsilon goes to 0. We have to show that that is valid. It may not be true. Maybe that S2 is very big. So even though that it's multiplied, even though it's multiplied by epsilon, this may not be correct. But it is going to be correct. We're going to see that. Okay, and we're going to show that epsilon squared S3 is negligible compared with um, epsilon S2 and so on. Okay, as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so. So what happens if we, pl if we try? So this is the beginning of WKB. What we're going to say, let's experiment. And let's see whether or not this is a valid way to represent y. Could that be consistent with putting an epsilon squared in the differential equation? So we're beginning with the differential equation, epsilon squared y prime prime equals qy. So on the right-hand side, we get, if we substitute this perturbation series, we get e to the uh, 1 over epsilon sum of you know, s sub n epsilon to the n over here. And on the left side, we have y double prime. Okay. Now, when you calculate one derivative of this, one derivative, you pull down this series multiplied by epsilon. You get the derivative. When you take two derivatives, you have either a 1 over epsilon sum from 0 to infinity, epsilon to the n s sub n double prime, or else you have 1 over epsilon squared times the sum of uh, epsilon to the n s sub n prime squared. Do you all see that? 
So this is the s double prime that we have looked at before. This is the s prime squared, and what I talked about last week. Okay, and this is the right hand side of the equation, and all this is multiplied by e to the one over epsilon, uh, you know, epsilon to the n s sub n, and we can divide this out of both sides of the equation, and we conclude that epsilon squared, 1 over epsilon sum, epsilon to the n, s sub n prime prime, plus 1 over epsilon squared, sum epsilon to the n, s n prime squared is equal to q. Is this possible? I mean, can we now have a dominant <coughs> balance? Yes, we can. <clears throat> we now get a dominant balance. So let me write this out now very carefully. Okay? If you multiply epsilon squared times the first term here, you get epsilon times the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, epsilon to the n, s sub n prime prime. And over here, the epsilon squares cancel, and you have a square of a series. Do you know how to square a series? What is the nth term? in the square of a series? Sum over from 0 to n for a binomial coefficient. Well, no, not a binomial coefficient. We're just squaring this series. Just, just squaring a series. So it's a con you end up with a convolution. What do you get when you square this series? The epsilons cancel. You have a series from n equals 0 to infinity, epsilon to the n. But the nth term in that series is a convolution. It is the sum from j equals 0 to n of sj, sn minus j. <clears throat> Do you see that? So and this is equal to q. Epsilon to 2n, then? No, epsilon to the n. Think about it. If you have a series a plus a0, plus epsilon a1 plus epsilon squared <clears throat> a2 and so on, and you square it, the first term of the series is a0 squared. The next term of the series is epsilon times a0 a1 plus a1 a0. The next term is epsilon squared times a0 a2 plus a1 a1 plus a2 a0 and so on. One term, two terms, three terms, four terms. It's precisely this. Okay, And now, one last step. You see there's an epsilon times epsilon to the n? Let me write that as epsilon to the n plus 1. And let's shift so that this becomes a series in powers of epsilon, so it becomes the sum from n equals 1 to infinity epsilon to the n, sn minus 1 prime prime. <clears throat> now, this is the starting point of WKB. And now I'm going to show you something absolutely wonderful. I mean, really wonderful. <clears throat> what is the coefficient of epsilon to the 0? Epsilon to the 0 in this system of equations. What's the coefficient of epsilon to the 0? S0 squared. OK. S0 prime squared equals q. Very good. We've seen that equation before, haven't we? Okay. This is a repeat of what we've done. You've already seen WKB. What you see here, solution to this equation, is S0 is equal to plus or minus the square root of q integrated. Okay? Good. What's the coefficient of epsilon to the 1? Well, as soon as the power of epsilon gets higher than 0, I think we better raise this. <laughs> Okay. As soon as the coefficient, as soon as epsilon, the power of epsilon gets greater than zero, there's nothing on the right hand side. So the first equation, so the coefficient of epsilon to the one here 
is just S0 prime prime. And the coefficient of epsilon to the 1 over here is 2 S0 S1 prime prime. What's the coefficient of epsilon squared? It would be S1 prime prime plus um, S0 prime S2 prime plus S1 prime squared plus S2 prime S0 prime, two of these, is equal to 0, and so on. Okay, And the coefficient of epsilon to the n, it is s n minus 1 double prime plus the sum uh, from j equals 0 to n, s j s n minus j prime is equal to 0. Now, I want you to just look at these equations before we quit today. You notice that I have a trivial equation to solve for S0. There it is. Next, I want to solve for S1. But it's trivial, right? I just divide by this piece, put it in the denominator here, and that tells me S1. If I want S2, you notice S2 appears only linearly. It's right here. So I divide by whatever is multiplying it. I already know S1 and you know, S0. So I can immediately say what S2 prime is, and then I take off the prime and integrate it, and I'm done. And in general, here's the nth equation. I can immediately solve for Sn prime is equal to blah, blah, blah. Okay, divided by some something or other, and integrated. That gives you Sn. This is amazing. Why is this so amazing? Because we started out with a differential equation that nobody knows how to solve. And we've reduced it to a sequence, an infinite sequence, of absolutely trivial equations. These are just trivial algebraic equations. And I never have to solve a differential equation. All I do is integrate this once, and integrate this once to find s1, integrate it once to find s2, integrate it once to find s3, 4, 5, 6. WKD is really, really wonderful. Okay. So I've reduced a differential equation to nothing more, more than introductory calculus. All you have to do is this integral, that integral, that integral, the next one, the next one. So I've reduced the problem of solving a differential equation to the problem of taking an integral and another integral and another integral. Just find s0, s1, s2. Do you see that? That's all there is to WKB, to, you might think. That's the, base, that's the backbone of, of, of WKB. That's the idea. This is what comes from Mr. Green. Why is this interesting? Well, to begin with, it's not a conventional perturbation series. We are not doing conventional perturbation theory because the perturbation series is in the exponent. We're assuming that y is an exponential of a perturbation series. It's not a perturbation series. It's an exponential of a perturbation series. That's very interesting. That's the first thing that's very interesting. Second thing is, now I, I know you're going to be amazed when I tell you this, but <clears throat> this series is a divergent series. So in fact, you can't write an equal sign here. You can only write an asymptotic sign. And all of these calculations are assuming that asymptotics is valid which it is, unless something goes wrong. And every once in a while, with WKB, something interesting happens. Do you know, do any of you know what is the, before we quit, any of you, can any of you tell me what is the interesting thing that might happen, that might happen, might not happen? What could, what could possibly go wrong with WKB?
Anybody know? Some S prime equals zero. If S prime equals zero, then we don't care. Zero. That's not. Okay. You notice here we calculated S naught. The next equation <coughs> tells me S one prime. And from this equation, we learned that S uh, one prime, this here's S one prime right here. It's equal to minus one half S naught prime prime over over S naught prime. That's that's what this equation says, right? But we just said that S naught prime, this is minus one half. What's S naught prime? S naught prime from here. S naught prime is um, plus or minus the square root of q. And what would S naught prime prime be? It would be q prime over 2, again, times the square root of q. So let's erase this. So S1 prime is equal to minus 1 quarter q prime over q. Okay. And so S1 is equal to minus 1 quarter log of q. You've seen all this before. We've done this in class. Okay? So if I stopped over here, I would conclude that y is asymptotic to e to the 1 over epsilon times plus or minus the integral of the square root of q. And the exponential of minus 1 quarter log of q would be q to the 1 quarter. So this would be if you just throw away s2, s3, s4, just throw all that stuff away, that's the conclusion. This is called the WKB approximation. And this is what we have seen in class. Okay. What could possibly go wrong? It's very interesting. Basically, nothing can go wrong unless Q is equal to 0. Because if Q happens to be 0, then Y is infinity. Ah! That can't be right. But Q equals 0, we can't calculate S1. This is what I was saying. You said S1 equals 0. If S0 equals 1, if Q equals 0, we can calculate S1. Oh, you said that. Oh, I thought, oh, I, what I thought you said was if S1 equals 0. OK, but you said, OK, good. So this could be a disaster. What does it mean physically if Q equals 0? What happens at the place where Q equals 0? Well. You go all the way back up at the top of the board. And remember, q is v of x minus e. What happens if q equals 0? The turning point was good. That's a, called the turning point. Okay? The particle, <clears throat> that happens when the total energy of a particle is equal to its potential energy. If the total energy of a particle is equal to its potential energy, then the particle has no kinetic energy. So the particle has stopped. So if the particle stops, ah, all hell breaks loose. It's a disaster. Okay. And what I'm going to explain to you to do, this is the incredible calculation <coughs> that you do with WKB, is how to handle this problem. This is the deep, difficult problem with WKB. And it's going to take me a whole lecture to explain to you what to do when q is equal to 0. And when we solve this problem, we will understand at a very deep level the nature of quantization. Okay, that's where you that's where quantization comes from. Okay, any questions? Yeah, question. My question was a little bit uh, further back about the uh, phi to the 4. Yeah. Uh, so you derived we basically understood how the series for phi to the fourth theory diverges from this quantum mechanical model. Could we also come up with a quantum mechanical model which would tell us how the asymptotic series for QED or QCD uh, would uh, converge? Or Tibra, diverge? if you have ideas on this, we're going to write 
a prize winning paper. <laughs> okay. Let me tell you, it's people can understand the divergence of what is called super renormalizable theories. So that means phi to the four theory and less than four dimensions, four minus epsilon dimensions. Okay. Then we can understand that the perturbation series really diverges like n factorial. As you reach four dimensions, which is the critical dimension for phi to the four theory, the graphs themselves can become very big for the right. first time. Now, and, and this is what happens in any theory when you reach its conformal limit, okay, when it becomes renormalizable instead of super renormalizable. This is an unsolved problem. Okay, and the, and the one place to begin is also to understand what's going on in electrodynamics. What happens with electrodynamics? And nobody knows. This is a fantastically interesting topic. I regard it as really gripping. Somebody, the, the consequences are immense to understand what is going on. But it means basically that you have this, this dispersion relation that I proved to you. The significance of that is we have to understand what happens in electrodynamics when you reverse the sign of alpha. Okay? If you reverse the sign of alpha, then the Coulomb force changes, and particles of like charges um, are, are now not repelling. They attract. And particles of unlike charges, a plus charge and a minus sign, repel each other. Okay, so why is the vacuum unstable? It's unstable because, you know, if this is a vacuum, you ha in electrodynamics you have virtual pair production, plus and minus. In conventional electrodynamics, they attract each other and disappear back into the vacuum. But if we have to change the sign <coughs> of the coupling constant, in this case the coupling constant is not e but alpha. Okay, so if alpha which is e squared, alpha goes to minus alpha. So e is replaced by i times e. OK? <clears throat> now, the vacuum is unstable. OK? If the vacuum is, un how do you understand the vacuum being unstable? When you create a virtual positive plus and minus pair in the vacuum, they now feel a repulsive force. So they push each other away. Now. Do they push each other away to the rest to, to the end of the universe? No, because it, they only last a very short amount of time. The amount of time they last give, is given by the uncertainty principle, delta E. Delta T, delta E is about h bar. So delta T is very short. So they only last a very short time, and then they disappear back into the vacuum. So you might think the vacuum is stable. But every once in a while, very, very rarely, this is so large, okay, there's a distribution of delta t's, that the particles have a long enough time to push each other <coughs> far enough apart to gain enough energy to pay back the energy they borrowed from the vacuum in order to come into existence in the first place as virtual particles. And they are now real particles, and they're traveling out to infinity. That's what tunneling is, okay? They have tunneled through the barrier. They've gone far enough that they can roll down the other side of the barrier. Okay? So very, very, very slowly, particles tunnel off to infinity. You have a huge pile of positive charges over here, all stuck together. A huge pile of negative charges over there, all stuck together. Okay? This is a very slow process. The vacuum lasts a very long time, because it's only very rare that a particle can last long enough to tunnel out to infinity. Most of the time, when a particle tries to tunnel, it just comes right back again. It doesn't succeed. Okay? The vacuum becomes unstable, slightly unstable. This process is Hawking radiation. Okay? It's tunnel. Particle pair being created, and the particle tunnels out to infinity. Hawking, it's basically Hawking radiation. It's precisely the same idea. Okay? And, um, so the vacuum is now unstable, and we have to calculate the lifetime of that vacuum state, and then take its nth inverse moment. And that tells us whether or not in electrodynamics, tells us how rapidly the perturbation series diverges. Some people think 
that the perturbation series does not ver diverge like n to the n, as in boson theories, but log n to the n, or something like that. Or possibly, you know, so the, there, there are various conjectures about how it might behave. <coughs> Nobody knows. This is an unsolved problem. Boy, would I love to know the answer and how to crack into that problem. Maybe you can get it by studying Feynman diagrams in electrodynamics, having arbitrarily large number of vertices, and study the asymptotic properties of those stuff. Really, really an interesting problem. I mean, there's a lifetime of research in that area. So I've written lots of papers on this, and but this is just, I mean, the big problem lies ahead. This is where there's a whole huge area of potential research papers. 